is here this morning. I hope you are ready to worship. Uh, we are just getting ourselves together and getting started, uh, but it is great to have you here this morning uh, as we are going to be just singing some great songs and then opening up the Word of God and looking at one of the miracles that Jesus performed. And so as we begin, uh, the song we're beginning with today is just probably one of my favorite songs. Um, it is called Happy Day, and it is just such an, a celebratory song that reminds us of everything that he's done for us. So uh, let's sing together. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 58, it says, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Where, O oh, death, is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. Greatest day in history, death is beaten, you have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. Empty cross, the empty grave, life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive. He's alive and oh, happy day, happy day, you wash my sin away. Oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same. For At last, meeting face to face, I am yours, Jesus, you are mine. And the joy, perfect peace, earthly pain finally will cease. Celebrate, Jesus is alive. He's alive. Happy 
happy day. I'll never be the same. Oh, happy day, happy day. You wash my sin away. Oh, happy day, happy day. I'll never be the same. Forever I am changed. What Okay, come on now. Seriously. That is the most incredible thing that he has done for us, right? He is worthy to be praised. I mean, I, listen, I, I know it's hot, right? How many of you are a little warm right now? Okay, I'm, 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 I'm like sweating up here. But I'm just telling you, he is worthy of praise. He is worthy of honor. The day that he set you free should be greater than your birthday, greater than your anniversary, greater than any other day. It, it, it's graduation day, right? Because you have been set free from the power of sin in your life, and it is good. Amen. All right, let's just keep going. <laughs> and steady my hope is held in your hand when castles crumble and breath is fleeting upon this rock I will stand upon this rock I will stand Glory, glory, we have no other king but Jesus, Lord of all. Raise the anthem, our loudest praises ring, we crown him is hidden beneath heaven's shadow your crimson flood covers me yeah your crimson flood covers me glory glory we have no other king but Jesus Lord of
victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. I will not be anxious. Jesus, you are near. The peace of God surrounding me, casting out all fear. The hand that holds the heavens is the mighty hand that saves. The voice that calms the stormy seas is calling me by name. I'm singing in the victory, the victory of the cross, and resting in the shadow, your redeeming love. I'm standing on the promise, the promise of new life. Cause I am yours forever, Jesus, you are mine. Oh, Jesus, you are mine. When I have forgotten. fullness of your grace. Yes, I remember Calvary when you took my place. I'm singing in the victory, the victory of the cross, resting in the shadow, your redeeming love. On the promise, the promise of new life, cause I am yours forever. Jesus, you are mine. Oh, Jesus, you are mine. Oh, Jesus, you are mine. Oh, 
his heart to sing in all. There is no one like you, God. Love immeasurable and First Chronicles 29, 11, it says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and the earth, yours is the dominion, O Lord. And you exalt yourself as head over all. The splendor of the King, God in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light. Trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice. How great is our God! Sing with me, how great is our God! And all will see how great, how great.
You're the name. You're the name above all names. You are worthy of all praise. And my heart will sing how great is our God. You're the name. people said, amen. You can be. Well, good morning. If that didn't get something moving in you, your, your excitometer is broken. I'm just telling you, right? Because there is something good about praising our God and our Savior. And, uh, and it is great to have you here this morning. I hope that you are ready. Um, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. Uh, we have been in a series of sermons that we've been looking at the miracles of Jesus right? Um, one of the reasons why I wanted to study the miracles of Jesus is a lot of times we'll focus upon the teaching of Jesus, right? We'll focus upon his words. And, and while, while the teachings of Jesus are essential, don't get me wrong, okay? Um, there's other things that we kind of need to kind of pull out of Jesus's life. Um, and there's other ways that we can learn about him. Uh, the other ways that we actually learn about him is seeing what he did and how he responds to circumstances in life, right? Because a lot of times uh, we find that the way that he encountered situations, the way that he responded to situations, teaches us as much as the words that he actually spoke. Today, um, today we're, we're kind of in a world that is battling over words, right? Um, you know, I, I, it's been interesting. There's this, kind of this huge ideological battle right now in our world of how we define words. Um, and this isn't actually a new battle. This has been around for a long, long time. 
but it seems to come, has come to a really huge head lately, um, specifically because of postmodern culture, the way that postmodernity post looks at words. Um, they kind of say, well, you can define words however you want to define them. Um, and I think this is one of the reasons why Jesus came in flesh, right? This is one of the reasons why he came and he interacted with us and, and he, he lived and he walked in certain ways um, because a lot of times what we find is that you can, you can read the words of Jesus and you can draw your own ideas out of the words of Jesus because of the culture that we live in that it's kind of hard because people can interpret them in all different ways. Um, but, but when we realize that we see the acts of Jesus, how he moves, how he does things, um, it's, it's an interesting situation that we learn more about him because of the way that he lived. Um, it's interesting. There are times that I'll get into conversations with people, specifically who who decide to read through the Bible with us, right? How many of you have tried to read through the Bible, right? And you get into the Old Testament, you read the Old Testament, and you begin to go, wow, I don't know that I really like God, <laughs> right? I don't know that I really like God because he seems so angry and mean and, and all of this different thing. But here's the thing. The thing that we have to realize is Jesus is God. So when you see Jesus, when you see how Jesus acts, that's who God is, right? And so what we have to kind of put into our perspective, people think that God is different in the Old Testament than he is in the New Testament, and that isn't true. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? And so when we see that, we have to understand that the only reason why we think God is angry and mean in the Old Testament is because we're reading it with a lens. And we have to understand, first of all, Jesus wasn't as meek and mild as we make him out to be, right? There are times when Jesus is very, very upfront and confrontational, but, God, but he is also very, very loving. And that's what we love to focus on, right, is God's love. And today we're going to do that. But understand that Jesus is not different. And, and quite frankly, one of these days, we'll actually preach through Revelation, where you get a whole other picture of Jesus than you ever get in the Gospels, right? Because Jesus is the same, and God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so this is one of the reasons why we examine and we look at the life of Jesus and the acts of Jesus because it gives us a more well-rounded view of who God is. It's one of the reasons why we study the miracles. Um, so many of you know who Albert Einstein is, right? I love this quote. Albert Einstein said this, I'm a Jew, but I am enthralled by the luminous figure of the Nazarene. No man can read the Gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. His personality pulsates in every word. This is not a man who was a Christian, but he understood that as we read the Gospels, as we study the Gospels, as we look at who Jesus is, it jumps off the page to us. And what we have to begin to do is translate that into our understanding of who God is in the Old Testament. The amazing thing is Jesus was and is a real person, right? who was God in flesh, but who was also very human, okay? When, when we try and separate God's divinity from his humanity when it comes to Jesus, that's bad theology, right? There was actually a, a struggle in the early church called docetism, which said that Jesus really wasn't human, he just appeared to be human. That was struck down. It was said, no, that's heresy. We have to understand that he was fully divine and fully human. And he experienced the same stuff we do, right? He had the same issues we do. He experienced the same heartbreak that we do. 
the same emotions, the same struggles. The only thing that he didn't personally deal with is sin, right? He didn't sin. But here's the, here's the deal. He still experienced the consequences of sin, right? Because Scripture tells us that he who knew no sin became sin for us. He experienced the separation that comes with sin separating us from God. And that's, that's amazing. I mean, I, I don't even fully understand it. I don't get how that works. But I know that he has gone through every single thing that we have. And so this is why we study the life of Jesus. This is why we, we get to know him and we study the miracles to see how he lived and how he responded to circumstances. Today we're going to be looking at as I said, another one of the miracles that was performed by Jesus in the northern area of Israel. And um, this time, it's actually not in the city of Capernaum, right? We've been in the city of Capernaum for the last several weeks. We've been talking about Capernaum, how important that city was. But this is actually a little town called Nain, N-A-I-N, N-A-I-N. And we're going to talk about that city just a little bit. Luke chapter 7 Starting in verse 11, it says, Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain. Good. And his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gates, a dead person was being carried out. The only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. Then he went up and he touched the bier. They were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. And they were all filled with awe and praise God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. And this news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. It's a fascinating story, isn't it? Once again, as we read this story we can skip by some things that we might not normally see because, because it's such a familiar scene to us. Uh, but, but there's some nuances here that I really want us to see. First of all, uh, let's talk about this city called Nain. Nain is a small town. It's about 30 miles from Capernaum. Okay? Um, if you kind of look, you remember where Capernaum is? It's up at the top of the Sea of Galilee. You see Nain is down here. It's actually right on the edge of Mount Borea. Okay? That's, that's not Mount Moriah. I, I looked it up. It's not. It's Mount Moriah. And, and it's about eight miles from Nazareth. Now, we know what Nazareth is, right? Nazareth is where Jesus grew up. And so, this is a very small town. Um, probably in the days of Jesus, uh, there wouldn't have been very few people who lived there. Maybe two, three hundred people at the most. It's a small uh, farming village. Not like Capernaum where it's a fishing village and everybody, they're kind of just self-sustaining, right? On the edge of the mountain. And it says, soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. Now, the words there, soon afterwards, um, could be the next day, or it could actually mean the next thing that he did, okay? Now, so we're picking up from last week, where Jesus had just healed the centurion's servant. Remember that? Okay? And so, we're picking right back up. Jesus goes, and he heals this centurion's servant. It's an amazing deal. And then, it says, basically, the next day, or the next... The next thing that he did, so if it's the next day, he's hoofing it, 
Like he's out of town and he's moving because it's about a day's journey from Capernaum to this place. And, and so we see this. Now, why is Jesus moving? Well, he has a divine appointment, right? Because remember, Jesus is God. He knows what's happening. And Jesus has a divine appointment that he is going for. He's on a mission. And notice it also says that there was a large crowd, right, that went along with him. So he had his disciples, which we know at this time, he's at least got 12 that he's commissioned, but he's got probably maybe 100 more, right? And so he's got a lot of people with him, but this isn't, the, this isn't a word for like 100 people. This is like the word for like 1,000 people, okay? So he's got a huge crowd, a multitude is what this word means. And, and so Jesus is walking along, and these people are happy, right? I mean, think about it. They've just seen Jesus heal this centurion servant. They've seen him doing miracles. They're, they're like, man, this is awesome. Why are they following him? They want to see what else is going to happen. They're excited. They're happy. They're, they're going along. They're going, man, this is cool. I cannot believe that we get to see all this stuff. And they're just waiting to see what he's going to do next. Verse 12, it says, And he approached the town gate. A dead person was being carried out, and the only son of a mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. Now, this is why I say this was a divine appointment. Jesus' timing is perfect. Right? He shows up at just the right moment. If, if he's any sooner, they're still in the house. If he's any later, they probably wouldn't have even stopped because there's way too many people for that town to have thousands of people go in. So Jesus' timing is perfect. Now, the burial of a person in the time of Jesus was a quick thing. I just want you to hear this, right? They don't mess around. Today, if someone dies, uh, they're put like in a morgue, and then they're sent to a funeral home, and we kind of preserve the body, and we wait, and we deal with all that kind of stuff to kind of schedule out what we want to see. They didn't have that advantage, right? Instead, it was usually within the same day. So this guy dies, and usually within eight hours, they've got mourners coming to the house to mourn with the family, and then they start the processional, okay? Now, uh, this is a, actually a picture of, of, in India, this is the common way that burials are done in the East. And this would have been very like what would have happened in Jesus' day, okay? Now, we think, okay, well, we're going we're gonna to put him in a coffin, and we're going to have a visitation, and we're going to close the coffin, and we're going to wheel it on nice little wheels, and we're going to put it in a hearse, and then we're going to do our processional that way in cars, right? That's not the way that it would happen in Jesus' day. What they would do is the person would die, they would immediately begin to wrap the body up into cloth with spices and things like that to prepare the body so that it didn't stink. And they would put it on something called a beer. Okay, that's not alcohol. That's, that's the other beer. Okay, and it's, it's, a, it's a litter is basically what we call them today, right? A kind of a stretcher. And they would put this and they would, they would carry the body open, nothing covering it other than the cloth. And, and this is the scene that Jesus walks into. And, and so Jesus is walking in, and there are mourners. Now, the word that, that's used here um, that's descriptive of this large crowd That's another Greek word, and it means like hundreds, 
okay? So probably most of the town shows up for this burial. Most of them are showing up to show their respects. And it says, as he approached the town gate, the dead person was being carried out. The only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town were with her. Jesus comes to name. The funeral procession is coming out of the city. And this huge crowd, laughing, happy, expectant, looking for Jesus to do something. And another crowd come face to face. See the picture? Two worlds collided. The hopeful and the hopeless. The expectant and the mourning. You ever been in a really awkward situation? Like, awkward. You know what I'm talking about? You show up and something's really off. That's this moment. This crowd of mourners is coming out wailing and crying, and here's this other crowd of people coming up going, yeah! Oh. What do we do? How do we respond? Now notice, this woman is a widow. She's already lost her husband, right? She's been through this before. And now it tells us that, that she has lost her son as well. I don't know about you, there's, there's nothing that I've ever experienced like a funeral for a child. Right? There's, it's like there's something wrong in that moment. Parents go, I shouldn't be burying my kid. Right? She's already lost her husband. Her only son is now dead. In, Jewish, in the Jewish society, this means she's destitute. Okay? She has no way to provide for herself. In that culture, women didn't work necessarily, right? They depended upon the husband, and their, her husband has died, so she would depend upon her son. Now, the word that's used when Jesus speaks to this is young man, which means he's, he's of age, probably 20, 25. So he's a young man, but he's taking care of his mom. And the son dies, and she's left with nothing. No one to take care of her. But that's not the immediate concern, right? The immediate concern is she's lost somebody who she dearly loves. She's completely alone. There's nobody to share the grief with her, right? I mean, yeah, there's a, there's a huge crowd. There's mourners. But she's going to go back to an empty house. She's going to be all alone. She's not going to have anybody. And even with that kind of grief, oftentimes you can be in the middle of a crowd and still feel completely alone. Right? What we find interesting about the time of Jesus is there were actually people that were professional mourners, right? So when somebody died, they would show up and they would be paid to be professional mourners. Now, that sounds weird to us, right? But part, part of the reason why is because they were the people who actually carried the litter. And they were compensated because while you touch the litter, you become unclean. And so part of the job of a professional mourner was to come and help prepare the body, kind of like an undertaker, and then to carry the litter and to create this environment where 
the person who was taking care of the, the, who was mourning, didn't have to be wrapped up in all of those different things. But they, they left. They were gone. That was all that they had. Yeah, Denise. Yeah. Yeah. You still hire the, the professional mourners. Yeah. It's yeah, it's it's a really strange scene, right? And 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 the reason why is because if if you don't have enough emotion for the Jews, then then you weren't loved. <laughs> if there isn't a big hoopla, if there isn't a big problem, if there isn't a big scene, then then this person wasn't cared for. They weren't loved. And so this became kind of a cultural thing, and it's really weird, but, but you, can, you can see the scene. There's this loud mourning and crying and wailing coming out of the city, and there's this raucous crowd following Jesus, and they come together. The worst thing about death is the world doesn't stop, right? I mean, any, any of you lost somebody that was, like, close to you, like, really close? You want the world to stop, right? You want everything to just kind of shut down for a little bit so that you can deal with this. But the world doesn't stop. It just keeps moving. It keeps going. And... and even the people that, that say that they love you and they care for you, their world keeps going. And you're kind of left. So this woman is grieving. She's mourning. She's destitute. She's alone. And then things get worse because then the world kind of invades her world. And everybody's happy. Everybody's joyful. And there's this awkward kind of, what do I do with it now? And you can almost see the scene, right? The, the crowd with Jesus kind of sees the scene and they go, oh. And there's probably a few of them that are going, but it's not real. And she's hurting. Even some people might be thinking, well, at least it didn't happen to me. Glad that didn't happen. Glad I'm not dealing with that. And so it's a little uncomfortable for everyone. As I said, when we read these, we read them so quick, we don't think about what's going on, right? Nobody can understand the pain that she's going through, except one, except one, the man at the center of the crowd. There's a look that he gives her. He sees her. Remember, Jesus knows what's about to happen to her, right? It's a divine appointment. And remember, he's teaching his disciples, right? Just, a, just a, like a chapter before. What did he do with Peter? We talked about this. I'm going to make you what? A fisher of men, right? I'm going to teach you how to reach people. I'm going to teach you how to impact people. I'm going to teach you what it means to draw people in. And so Jesus is not only seeing her, but he's teaching. That's why he's doing this. He's got the divine appointment. Look at it, verse 13. 
when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. And he said, don't cry. What's the first five words there? When the Lord saw her, right? Guys, this is where the rubber meets the road. Jesus is teaching his disciples, whom hopefully you are some of those disciples, right? Because he teaches us how to fish for men, how to minister to people. And the first part is this. It begins with seeing. You have to look. You have to see. You cannot love people unless you see them. Right? Think, think about this. I mean, let's be honest for a second. Anyone walk down in New York City? Right? It's got a ring. Can you just pull down the main volume just a little? I, I don't know about you. I was trained on how to walk through New York City. Right? Seriously, I was, I was trained. I was taught. I, anyone know what I'm about to say? Right? You see a homeless person? Eyes straight forward. Don't acknowledge them. Don't look at them. Just keep walking. They might ask you for some money. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus doesn't just keep walking. He sees her. Yes, it's awkward. But he locks eyes, and he sees her, and he sees her pain. I'm not pointing fingers, guys. I do it. I'm ashamed to say I do it. You're in the car. Here's a guy holding a sign, and you're like, just don't give, just don't even look. Just keep looking at the road. I know. But it says, Jesus saw her. He saw her. You got those note cards in front of you. Write this down. Pull, pull out that note card. Write something down. Who is it that makes you uncomfortable? <laughs> and you've actually begun to avoid them, right? Because you're like, I don't know that I really want to get inside that mess. I'm being serious. I know you're, you're like going, I ain't writing that down. Okay. But we all have that, right? We all have people that we go, I just don't know if I really want to hang out with them. That's a whole lot of mess that I just can't handle right now. I'm, I'm being honest. I've got those people. Now, here's the interesting thing. It says, not only did Jesus see her, but here's the next step. His heart went out to her. Other versions say he had compassion on her. I love the word compassion. The Greek word for compassion, uh, literally, uh, let me see if I can say it right. Spank lidzdomai. Right? So it's a really, it's a guttural kind of word, okay? Literally, the, the word spleen we get from that word. And it means your guts, right? That Jesus had compassion on her, but it's not just, oh, I'm so sorry for you, dear. It means his guts were wrenching for what she was dealing with. That, that there was something that was deep inside of him that was moved by her. 
by her circumstances. He was compelled to act because of the, the situation. Why? Because he saw her. Right? He didn't just see her with his eyes. He saw her. And, and there was an intensity. And then Jesus does something that makes no sense whatsoever. He walks up to her and says, don't cry. What? That, that doesn't make any sense. He's, he's seen her. He is moved with compassion. His, his guts are wrenching. And then he says, oh, don't cry. Right? Now, why would Jesus do that? Well, because he knows what's about to happen. Right? Because he's going to do something. Literally, the word here is don't mourn. Not just don't cry. It's don't mourn. He's forecasting for her what's going to happen here. Here's the secret of the passage, I think. We have to see people. That's the first step. The second step is we have to allow ourselves to be moved by their situation, right? Now, this might require us suspending some judgment, right? This might require us to kind of take a step back and go, this isn't really about me right now, right? But then the third thing that Jesus does, and it's the most powerful thing, is we have to act. We have to do something, right? Because it's not enough to just see somebody and to have compassion. We have to step in and do something. And this is what we see that Jesus does. We've all heard it said, actions are louder than words. Jesus proves the point. Right? It's not enough to say, oh, I'm praying for you. First of all, pray for them. Don't just say you're going to pray for them. Because how many of you have done that before where you've said, I'll pray for you, and then you forget to? Hands way up. I'm there. Been there. Done that. Guilty. Right? Act. Pray right there with them. We have to act. See, if we don't act, we aren't loving. Can I be honest? We're not loving. Jesus comes to the ones who are most broken and who need the most comfort. Verse 14 goes on to say, Then he went up and he touched the bier they were carrying him on. And the bearer stood still and he said, Young man, I say to you, get up. If the words of 13 don't cry, aren't shocking enough, verse 14 blows us all away, right? Jesus goes up to the beer and he touches it. In the Mosaic law, that makes Jesus unclean, right? It makes him unclean. And anyone who touches him is unclean. Anyone who touches a dead body is unclean for seven days. Seven days. You're quarantined. If you touch something that's touched a dead body, you're quarantined for a day. Jesus has got a, a divine appointment. He's on his way. He knows exactly what's going to happen. He walks up and he touches And the people that are carrying the body, what do they do? They stop. 
Now, can I be honest with you? I don't think that there's any mistake in the words that are used in Scripture. I think there's, there's always extra little things that are there. Why does it say they stopped? Think about it. I mean, obviously, here's a rabbi, here's a teacher doing something that he should not do, right? He's, he's touching the dead. He's making himself unclean. But I think there could also be an analogy here that we're not seeing. Sometimes, hear me out, sometimes in our lives, when we encounter pain, when we encounter grief, when we encounter problems, what do we do? Just keep swimming, 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 just keep swimming, right? Keep moving. Don't stop. Don't let it sink in. Don't let it do anything, right? If I can just keep busy, if I can just keep going to work, if I can just keep doing this or that, I don't have to deal with the pain. And I think that there's times when God says, no, stop. Because I want to deal with this. I want to deal with this. I want to help you here. But we're so busy that we don't let God do the work that God wants to do. We just keep moving. See the parallel? Maybe today you have an issue that God's trying to get you to deal with. And you're just moving. And God's calling you to stop. Just listen. Wait. Wait for him to act. Because the great news is this. He can speak a word into your life, and he can raise back the very thing that you think is dead. He can do that work. He can change the circumstances. So Jesus speaks into the situation. And and I, I find this fascinating. Whenever Jesus raises people from the dead, he does it three times in his ministry, right? All Three times, he just speaks. All three times. We're going to see it here. We're going to see it with Jairus' daughter. And we're going to see it with Lazarus. All three times. He doesn't do all kinds of hoops. He doesn't do all these big rituals. He doesn't do, he just says, young man, get up. Lazarus, come forth. Right? Arise. That's all he does. Just speaks. He just speaks the power of God's word. Right? We don't need a big show. God can just speak into that circumstance. What's he want to speak into your life today? Verse 15. I love this. (laughs) The dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. The young man sat up and began to talk. Can you imagine? I mean, really? Really? What's he talking about, right? I mean, we, we all, if, if you really slow down and you think, you're like, what the heck did he say? Like, what just happened, <laughs> right? What in the world, right? But that's not the focus. Notice what the focus is. The focus is the mother, right? She's the one who's most broken, And Jesus gives him back to his mother. Right? Now, if if I'm Jesus, right, I heal somebody, what am I going to do? I'm going to start preaching, right? 
Did you see that? That's what the kingdom is going to be like. Lives are going to be renewed. They're going to be, right? Uh, Jesus doesn't do any of that, right? There's no book deal for the boy who came back from the dead. You know, the heaven is for real, right? None of that stuff. Jesus says, come see your mother. She's more important than the miracle. She's more important than the miracle. Can I tell you? This is important for us, right? At times when we minister, and I'll be the first to admit it as a pastor, right? Angelica, I'm going to ask you a question because you're, you're a pastor's wife. Okay? After Sunday service, what's the first question that Lloyd asks? I'm just being honest because I know, I know the question I could ask my wife, but how was the sermon? Right? That's the automatic question because, hear this, sometimes we think the gift is more important than the person who we give it to. Sometimes we get our focus wrong. See, Jesus isn't worried about the miracle. He's worried about the woman. And sometimes when we serve, when we serve God, our focus gets off on what we did, not on the results of what it's going to do. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but I do not, what? Love. I am a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all of the mysteries and all of the knowledge, and if I have faith, that can move mountains. I have faith that can raise somebody from the dead. But I do not have love. I'm nothing. If I give all I have to the poor, and I give over my body to hardship, that I might boast. But I do not have love. Gain nothing. People are what it's about. Loving people is what it's about. Hear this. And I, I, I'm stepping on my own toes right now. There are times when we get so focused on us if we do amazing things, but we're not loving people, it's worthless. Jesus is teaching these guys how to be fishers of men. And he says, you've got to love. You've got to see them. You've got to let it get to you. You've got to let it get deep. And then you've got to act. Because that's how you love. Start wrapping this up. Verse 16. They were all filled with awe, and they praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. Imagine the reaction. They were amazed. They praised God for what had just happened. And look at what they say. This is, this is funny to me, right? A great Prophet has appeared among us. Here's the cool part of the story. Nain is only mentioned one time. Nain is only mentioned one time. Right here. It's the only time that this city ever shows up. But there is a city that is less than one mile away. You see what it is? Shunem. Does anyone remember the town of 
Shunem, the Shunammite woman from the story of Elisha. Here's what's funny. In the story of Elisha, you can go, you can go read it this week, okay? Uh, here's my homework to you. Uh, there, there's this little town called Shunem, 2 Kings chapter 4, you'll find. Elisha is traveling back and forth, and this woman says, we need to build a place for this guy to come and stay. So he comes and he stays. And then he, he basically says, hey, you're going to have a child. And then we find later on that this child dies. And Elisha raises this child, this boy, from the dead. But here's what's interesting about the story. When Elisha does it, it's not instantaneous. See, Elisha has to go through this whole ritual. He, he goes in and he, he begins to pray and he lays down on the body and he breathes on it. And then he gets up and he checks it and it's still, it's starting to warm up, but it's not really alive. And he has to do it again and he has to pray and he paces around and he does this like over and over. And then finally the child comes back to life. Now that's pretty incredible, right? And it says, he then took him to his mother. Do you think Jesus has a divine appointment? Jesus is reenacting something from the Old Testament. These guys live less than a mile from the spot. Do you wonder why they said, wow, we've got a great prophet who's just arisen in Israel? Right? What was Elisha? A great prophet. But Jesus has done something that Elisha could never do. Jesus speaks and it's done. Jesus is the greater Elisha. Right? And he comes to this remote town and he does something that they would recognize, right? They would recognize this as a huge thing. And, and, and look at their response. God has come to what? To help his people. They recognize this wasn't just a prophet. This is God. God has come to do something amazing with his people. Let me draw you back to the application just for a moment. First of all, God sees your pain. Hear that. God is not oblivious to what you're going through. Right? Right now, if you're, if you're struggling with something, God sees, God sees you. He knows you. But hear this. We need to see others' pain. We need to see what's going on in their lives. It, okay, uh, men, young men, right? I'm, I'm just going to be, I'm, I'm confessing all over today. You ready? You walk into the house, you see the dirty dishes. Do you know what I'm talking about, though? Right? There's things that we see, but we don't look. Because it's like, oh, I don't want to be bothered with it. Right? <laughs> I'm not just talking about people. Yes, we walk through New York City. You can, you can get that, that experience every day. Right? But the little things as well. We've got to be, we got to be eyes open. Looking for opportunities. Not only does God see your pain, God is moved with compassion for you. God is moved by the things in your life. He, he wants to bless you. He wants to help you. And we need to be moved. And the greatest part is God acts on our behalf. Can I get an amen? God acts on our behalf. I said last week that we would be taking communion. 
Communion celebrates the event that brings us back to life. Right? Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1, says, As for you, you were, you were what? You were dead in your transgressions and your sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us, I love that, Paul, Paul doesn't, Paul doesn't put himself on a high plane. He says, all of us also live among them at one time. In other words, we all did the same stuff. We were all sinners. Gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath death, right? Punishment. That's what we deserve. But, there's no other greater word in Scripture than that. But, because of His great, what? Love for us. God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive. With Christ. Even when we were dead in our transgressions and our sins. For it is by grace that you have been saved. Communion is for those who have been made alive in Christ. Right? It's, it's, it's for those who have accepted the gift of salvation. For those who have been redeemed, if that's you, he's spoken the word to tell us die. It is finished. He did the work. It's done. And you have been made alive. You can take it. You can celebrate the resurrection, the resurrected life that he's given you. But I'm not, I'm just saying, there could be somebody here who has been playing the game, who hasn't truly made the choice, hasn't accepted the gift. If that's you, just let me tell you, there's no other better day to accept that gift, to be made alive in Christ. Sin separates us from God. It makes us dead to Him. But Jesus can speak that simple word and make you alive in Him. He can restore your soul. And all you got to do is ask. That's it. Nothing else. Because it's His word, not your word, that makes the difference. Everybody bow your head and close your eyes just for a second. Heavenly Father, God, we come to you and we thank you. God, I pray if there's one here who has not come to know you, that they would come to see their need for you, that you would move in their hearts and that they would accept you today so that when we take communion, they could do it with us and, and, and enjoy the fact of what you have done for us. Pray this in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Take take your communion. There's the bread side. The bread is a reminder that Jesus became flesh. Right? That he came. That he was real. It's not a figment of our imagination, but instead, he was real. 
He came, he lived a life, and he did the thing that was necessary for us to come into a relationship with him. So as we take this, it reminds us. Jesus said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take the cup. And we're reminded that it's by his blood, the covenant, the new covenant that he makes with us, that it's by his blood that we are made clean. So as we take it, we re- we're reminded of the shed blood of Jesus Christ who set us free. Take and drink. God, we are so grateful for what you've done. We're so grateful that you have made us alive in you. God, we pray that you would help us to see those around us. Help us to be moved with compassion for them. And help us to act out of love for them. We pray this in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Good stuff. I thought it was good. (laughs) I don't care what you think. Well, guys, it has been great to see you here today. Uh, For those of you who are guests of ours, first of all, thank you so much for being with us today. We are grateful. Uh, We actually have this card in the back of the chairs. Uh, It's a little orange card. It's called the Connection Card. Um, And it's just a a way to let us know who you are and thank you for being with us. Uh, So if you don't mind, fill out as much information as you feel comfortable. Um, We'd love to have an email address that we could just send you a little note. And thank you for being with us. Um, And on the back, by the way, there is a place for you, for everyone, right, to go ahead and fill out prayer requests. Um, And we love to pray over those um, and to just keep those in mind as we're going forward. But please take a moment to do that. And then you can uh, put that in the basket and the way out. It's right on the side of the door. Uh, We've got ways to give. Thank you so much for giving. We have been... uh, Let me just be honest, we've got our elder meeting hopefully this week, um, and we're going to sit down and talk about finances, but it's been a little rough, been a little rough for us, Um, and I I know I'm preaching to the choir, so I'm not not trying to draw blood out of a tournament, turn turn up, right? Um, We we know that there is, we're we're in an economic challenge right now, right? How many of you seen the gas prices have been going down though? Woo, praise God, right? (laughs) We need that, right? But we know also that, I'll just be honest, you cannot out give God. God will take care of us if we take care of the things that we're called to do. And so uh, just be faithful. Do that. We appreciate it. Uh, we've got the basket in the back. We've got online. We've got, you can mail it in, whatever else like that. Uh, next, sorry. Um, Grace Book Club. Oh, my. Sue's, Sue's got me right here. Reading Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. And he, uh, who who has not read Pilgrim's Progress? No, 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 no. Wow. Can, can, I, can I be honest with you? This is one book you do not want to skip out. Amazing book. It, it is probably one of the most classic novels, fictional novels. Uh, it's a, it's, I don't know how to say it. it's a parable, right? In some sense. It's an allegory. Thank you. That's the right word. Um, for the Christian life. Powerful. Don't miss it. Read it. Even if you don't go to the study, read it. 
because it will make an impact in your life. So that's what they're going to do. Uh, the discussion should be on September 20th. Uh, sorry? Everyone is welcome. Not just a girl thing. It's a girl and guy thing, right? Everybody can be part of that. Okay. Uh, back to school donations. We're going to be collecting those. Uh, Herdtown United Methodist um, is collecting school supplies, so we're going to join in with them, and we're going to do that to try and help the community in that way. Uh, so uh, please be part of that. Uh, we've got our Family Fifth coming up July 31st. Mark that on your calendar, Family Fifth. Uh, we're going to do a potluck. Um, what? Next Sunday. Next Sunday. Okay. See, I don't even know what day it is, so it's okay. That's why she keeps me in line. Okay, so next Sunday, Family Fifth, Potluck, come, bring a side dish. We're going to grill out. Hopefully, it's good weather. Um, if it's not, we'll come inside. All right? And then finally, prayer meeting. That's what it feels like when you guys don't show up. Prayer meeting, 6.30. Online, Zoom. You don't even have to leave your house. You don't even have to turn your camera on. Join us for prayer. There is no... Uh, prayer meeting, 6.30, Wednesday. Amen? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father God, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity to be together today. God, help us. Help us to love. Help us to love well. Help us to love those around us. Help us to love your church. Help us to love the community. Help us to make an impact. Help us to be fishers of men. Pray this in your sins. Amen. Go in peace.